Today we will start talking, continue talking about 3D supersonic potential flow. Um, as we continue our record, video recordings, just wanted to show you quickly where everything is on our Canvas site. The distance learning site and the on-campus site should be identical, although some of the items may be slightly transposed from one place to the other. So if you go to the Canvas site, in the supersonic flow regime, you would notice that words such as video, 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 these are the new videos. We talk about 2D supersonic flow. And there are some worked out examples which we cover based on a 2D supersonic flow theory called Acker's theory that is given in here. For homework number three, the most important parts are the video on a conical flow theory, the homework number three itself, and how to solve the homework number three, given both in the PDF format and also as a video. So these are the things you should be working on. We would also now start looking at a three-dimensional supersonic flow. This is the last piece of our work that we will be covering. There are some uh, references given in here. So if you click on that, you will find that there is an external reference to a series of uh, supersonic flow applications. These were developed during the 70s and the 80s. Some of them have a good date as far back as 1960s, 1956, 1963. But for the most part, computational programs were developed in the 70s and the 80s. So there's a lots of public domain useful information there. There are computer programs available publicly so these are the vehicles that were used to design previous generation of supersonic aircraft such as F-14, um, Concorde, even uh, F-18 and F-15. Today, CFD is taking the place of many of these uh, techniques. Nevertheless, during the early stages of design, it's very common practice to use these methodologies because they are very fast they could be integrated with a design code to design a geometry. One of the first things we should notice is that when we go to the, uh, the, uh, the 3D supersonic flow over, over aircraft is that unlike a subsonic flow and transonic flow, we cannot separate the wing from the fuselage because these tend to be very small aspect ratio vehicles. Therefore, it's not possible to say this is the wing, here is the fuselage, and do one separately from the other. They need to be totally integrated. We try to keep them together and keep the, the aspect ratio as small as possible so that the disturbances caused by the aircraft on the fluid are not large. These disturbances cause not only the shock waves, but also sonic boom. So it's a very common practice to integrate the design of the wing with the fuselage. Therefore, the design of the aircraft or the analysis of the aircraft must be done in an integrated sense. So we are still going to go to linearized supersonic potential flow. Once you go to nonlinear flow, it's not possible to do except using CFD, you see in current, current, uh, current uh, practice. So let's quickly continue with this particular lecture. As we mentioned earlier, supersonic aircraft has strong interaction between the wing, fuselage, engine, and empennage. Everything is closely coupled to each other. Small aspect ratio wing, very closely placed compared to the fuselage. Engines are often inside the fuselage or at the wing body junction such as in the case of F-15 or F-18. And the empennage is not too far back. It's very closely coupled to the fuselage and also to the main wing. So the whole thing has to be analyzed in an integrated fashion. CFT software such as um, Fluent, Star CCM, Open Foam, and government software such as Fun 3 d from NASA Langley, Overflow from NASA Ames, these are all being used to model these aircraft. <coughs> Nevertheless, linearized methodologies are very useful, especially during the very early stages of 
conceptual design. So sometimes you want to predict trends. For example, what happens if I change an aspect ratio? What happens if I move the wing forward or backward? So these type of studies, it's very expensive to do that using a CFT because of the parametric labor involved in generating the grid, computing the flow field, and extracting the important information. Therefore, people often turn to these simpler methods. So we are going to focus on these methods. We will not show you how to write such software. Uh, it's a course in itself. So we will just focus on the physical insight rather than the actual calculational details. As you mentioned, there are lots of uh, public domain software. NASA has got a lot of contact reports and there are uh, tools freely available to you if you want to look into that further. So this, for example, is a series of NASA contact reports where they talk about supersonic aircraft methodology. The panel methods where we use uh, not subsonic sources, but supersonic sources, where the effect of a source is confined to the Mach cone. Remember, beyond the Mach cone, there is a zone of silence. Sound waves cannot travel, penetrate beyond the Mach cone. So when we develop a supersonic sources, sinks, vortex panels, we need to take into consideration the domain of dependence carefully. So there's a large body of literature and theory that has been developed on such methodologies. So hierarchically, the following thing has been done. Early work was a very, very simple analytical closed form solution. These were very suitable for you by hand. You could do it on a calculator. You could do it using, certainly using a 1950s computers. Vortex lattice techniques, similar to what you have done in your homework number two, and also in quiz number one, were developed for supersonic flows. The, these uh, use a vortex filaments like we did, horseshoe vortices and so forth, are the closed vortex loops over the edges of the panel. The main thing is when you compute the induced velocity, the influence uh, for the function that you're computing will vary because of the supersonic flow. These require modest computer time of the order of minutes on today's computers. Of course, uh, most uh, high, highest order of accuracy, but also computationally more expensive are the CFT-based techniques. So let's uh, turn to a very simple linearized flow. We have already seen the linearized uh, potential flow equation. This is the small disturbance phi. This is Mach number in this case is greater than one. Therefore, this is a negative number. This is the boundary condition usually directly applied on the body surface rather than on a projected plane like we have been doing in our quiz. And this is the surface pressure distribution. One of the primary things that we want to do is to compute the lift from a wing body empennage configuration in supersonic flight, but also compute the associated drag. The L over D of an aircraft in subsonic flow or transonic flow is quite high. A look at the air file that you looked at in your homework number one in X-Foil you are getting CL of the order of 0 0.5. CD was of the order of 0 0.01. Therefore, L over D in 2D was of the order of 50, sometimes even of the order of 100. When you go to three dimensions, subsonic flow and transonic flow, because of the induced drag, the L over D dropped. Now, it was not quite so high as 50 to 100. It was more like 20 to 40. Nevertheless, subsonic aircraft and transonic aircraft tend to have a very high L over D. As we pointed out in earlier lectures, they have a, therefore a very large uh, range. Breguet range equation uh, says you need a very high Mach number times L over D in order to produce the maximum range. The minute go to, you go to transonic supersonic flow, wave drag kicks in. Therefore, L over D substantially drops. Often it is less than 10, close to five, six, seven. Therefore, supersonic aircraft do not have a very long range. So uh, that's a big limiting factor. 
So now we look at, let's look at the drag. The drag is made of several components. The first thing is the skin friction component. The horizontal axis is the drag coefficient. The vertical axis is the lift. So independent of the lift, the wetted area over the wing, fuselage, empennage produces skin friction drag. That is this particular box in here. So you saw in your homework number one, X5 was producing CD, which is caused by the boundary layer, laminar and turbulent. So this is basically the laminar and turbulent boundary layer skin friction drag. The next uh, component is a wave drag. This is not attributable to the lift. Therefore, regardless of the CL along the vertical axis, we get the same increment in the drag. No matter what the CL is, you get the same increment in drag. This is caused by the thickness effects. Remember that we did a, um, uh, some worked out examples in Acker's rule. I mentioned that uh, if you double the thickness, the wave drag will quadruple. So this is the thickness effect. It's got nothing to do with lift. The third component is the induced drag. Panel said the induced drag is CL squared. CD is CL squared divided by pi times aspect ratio. It's a parabolic curve. Therefore, this parabolic shape is caused by that relationship. So this extra increment in drag is caused by induced drag. The higher the lift, higher the contribution of the induced drag from the main wing. Not only is the main wing has induced drag, but the horizontal tail also is producing oftentimes a download to keep the vehicle in straight and level flight. So the horizontal tail is producing lift, therefore it's got its own, uh, its own uh, uh, drag. So that's this extra component. Again, it varies as CL of the tail squared divided by pi times aspect ratio of the tail. So this is the extra component caused by the tail surface or the empennage. So we call it a trim drag. Even the component of the extra drag caused by deflection of ailerons, flaps, etc., will come into play here. But normally in cruise flight, those components are not largest. It's only the tail empennage that causes this extra. Therefore, the drag is made of skin friction, which is independent of lift, no matter what the lift coefficient is. Thickness drag, wave drag, which is independent of lift again, the same jump in the drag regardless of the lift. Main wing induced drag, it increases as the lift increases parabolically. Then the empennage drag, again, it increases. So when you add all of these, you get this as a total drag. So one of the first things we will do is to construct a CL, which is on the vertical axis, versus CD on the horizontal axis. This is your ultimate goal. So designers will try to come up with this particular curve and try to push this curve as far to the left as possible, minimizing the drag for a given lift coefficient. Not only does a drag cause for loss in performance, you could link the drag to sonic boom. A thicker body not only will produce higher drag, but also produce a stronger sonic boom. So all these things are interconnected. Now, the draw the sources of drag, as we mentioned, are the skin friction. Any wetted area, laminar flow, turbulent flow will produce skin friction drag. Even a non-lifting body, because of the thickness, it will produce wave drag, we call it a zero lift wave drag, then the induced drag from the main wing and also from the empennage. So under trim drag is the drag from the empennage. By the way, the wing not only can produce induced drag, it can also produce wave drag. If you remember the flat plate at an angle of attack that we looked at under Accurate's rule, we got a CD of four alpha squared divided by lambda. So the higher the alpha, the higher the wave drag. So you may also get a wave drag because of the associative with the angle of attack. So though all of those things go in here. So let's start with the uh, uh, skin friction drag. How do you compute it? 
In uh, any industry analysis, at least during conceptual stages, they will assume everything is a flat plate, even though the body is highly curved. So they will say the boundary layer starts at the leading edge and starts growing along the streamwise direction. So each one of these lines is a representation of the streamlines, although they are not necessarily true. So once you know the distance from the leading edge, they will compute the skin friction drag coefficient as a function of the distance from the leading edge and the local Reynolds number. In the case of a wing, the leading edge starts at the leading edge of the wing. And they will pretend that the streamline is flowing along this line. We know in reality it may be flowing spanwise, it may be going towards the tip, or it may be flowing towards the root. But in this analysis, they assume it going from leading edge to trailing edge. So once you compute the skin friction drag, if you multiply this by one half rho v infinity squared, that gives you the force per unit area. So each and every panel will have a unit area, a certain area. So you multiply by the panel area. How do you find a panel area? You take it as a parallelogram. If you know the four corner points, one half of the diagonal vectors will produce the area of the parallelogram. One half of this, this vector cross this vector will produce the parallelogram. So let me see if I can show this a little bit better. One half of uh, this vector this vector uh, this vector to this vector will be the parallelogram. So once you compute the CD from the contribution from each and every panel, you'll add it all together. This is how we get the skin friction drag. You don't distinguish between the main wing and the empanage. Each one has got its own leading edge. Fuselage has got its own leading edge. You just measure the distance along from the leading edge, compute some empirically computed drag, skin friction coefficient, multiply by one half rho v in 3D squared, dynamic pressure times area. Then you divide by one half rho v in 3D squared times the wing area. So wing area goes in here. The dynamic pressure appears both in the numerator and the denominator, so it kind of cancels out. So this is how the skin friction drag is computed. Now let's go to the um, next component of drag. By the way, this is the, these are some of the empirical relationships. You will first find the surface temperature. This is like one plus gamma minus one over two times m infinity squared is the T naught stagnation temperature. If gamma is 1.4, gamma minus 1 over 2 will be 0.2. But because the boundary layer is conducting, you know, diffusion of heat can go from one layer of the boundary layer to another, surface is not quite so hot, it's a little bit cooler. So this number is not 0.2, it's 0.178. Once you find this um, temperature of the wall, this is the temperature at the edge of the boundary layer, you will find some kind of an average equivalent temperature all across the boundary layer. This is called a reference temperature. This is an empirical curve fit. Once you find a reference temperature, which you call T prime, then you look up viscosity using an empirical relationship called the Southern Sutherland Law. Once you have a, a reference temperature, you'll find the density from P equal to rho RT. Once you have the density, you will find the Reynolds number. Here the X is the distance from the leading edge, either of the fuselage or the wing or the empanage. Then once you have the Reynolds number, you'll compute the skin friction coefficient from empirical relationships. This is, for example, is for turbulent flows. Notice the power here is one over Reynolds number raised to the power 0.2. If it's a turbulent flow, if it's a laminar flow, will be one over square root of Reynolds number. So this relationship here is for turbulent flow. So you compute the CF, not directly using the free stream temperature, free stream density, but you walk through all these steps before you compute the skin friction. There are some references here 
that show how to compute the skin friction coefficient. Now the induced drag is nothing new, just like the panel of the thin line theory. It's proportional to CL squared divided by pi times the aspect ratio times some efficiency factor. So 1 over pi times aspect ratio times that efficiency factor could be written as a constant k. Now, rather than uh, twisting the wing, which may increase the angular dr wave drag, they will try to use a camber to distribute an elliptically loaded wing. So even in supersonic aircraft, you try to get an elliptical loading because it produces the lowest induced drag. So you compute the wing induced drag, tail induced drag, which is the horizontal tail induced drag, add them all together, that produces the induced drag from all lifting surfaces. But it's important that everything be scaled by not the tail area, but the main wing area. Because when you compute the CD of a whole aircraft, the reference area is the projected platform of the wing. So panel methods are used to compute the induced drag and also the wave drag to some extent. So the surface is divided into panels. On each panel, you use either a horseshoe vortex or a closed loop vortex. For example, if it's a non-lifting body, you use a closed loop vortex. Whereas if it's a lifting body, you will use a horseshoe vortex. So if you have a vortex here, let's say at this point, the influence of that point will be felt only in the Mach cone underneath it, behind it. It cannot penetrate up here. It cannot point down here, anywhere outside the Mach cone. In your homework number two and quiz number three, your AIJ of a filament here, a quiz number one, I'd rather, AIJ of a, this filament not only was responsible for, for this panel, but even for other panels upstream, downstream, inboard, outboard. But in supersonic flow, the influence of a vortex line or a vortex panel is limited to the Mach cone on which it acts. So that's a big difference. Once you have computed such things, you may start looking at um, pressure distribution at various planes. So this is the cross section of the fuselage. So this is a Z axis. So you measure the theta from the Z axis. So theta equal to zero means the crown line, the uppermost line of the fuselage. So you could see how is the pressure changing. Whenever the pressure rises rapidly from a negative value to positive value, notice that CP is a pressure coefficient. So it's a gauge pressure divided by dynamic pressure. So negative value means the local pressure is below atmospheric pressure. When it abruptly rises, it means it's increasing because of the, of the shock wave. So supersonic panel methods crudely, crudely capture shock wave effects. So anywhere you have a shock wave in, a, in real flow, here we are replacing it by a Mach line. So across the Mach line, the pressure will rise just as it happened in the case of accurate rule for our 2D examples. The wing fuselage junction, you'll get another shock wave. You'll get a very strong pressure rise. The wing tip, there may be an abrupt drop in the uh, drag and uh, so forth. So regardless, wherever you are, different values of theta, you could look at the pressure distribution then see where are the shock waves forming and try to redesign that region to mitigate the rise in the pressure caused by the drag, because this indicates a very strong shock wave. So perhaps you want to mitigate this. So panel methods are used using techniques such as these during the early 70s and 80s to kind of change the shape of the geometry, to smooth the rise in the drag, rise in the pressure, and rise in the wave drag caused by shock waves. You could also look at uh, well, how much is the wing contributing to the drag, how much is the fuselage and thickness contributing to the drag, how much is the total contribution. So again, you go from negative to positive. Whenever you have an abrupt rise in the pressure that's caused by the shock wave, in this case, at the wing body junction. Here you have an abrupt rise in the pressure, 
caused by the shock wave near the leading edge of the body. Here we see an abrupt drop in the pressure. That's because the thickness attributable to the wing it drops because the wing has abruptly ended. So these, th these type of things can be analyzed just by looking at pictures like this. So experienced wing designers, wing body designers, would look at uh, situations like this. During the 70s and 80s, uh, Grumman was developing F-14. French and the uh, English were developing Concorde. Boeing also tried to develop their own supersonic transport. Of course, uh, F-15, F-18, these are all designed using approaches such as these. We talked about L over D. We mentioned that uh, 2D aerofiles will have an L over D close to 100. 3D transonic aircraft will have an L over D close to 20, 25. Look at the supersonic aircraft. L over D is dramatically lower, less than 10. Therefore, these aircraft cannot travel long distances. The wave drag is so high for a given lift, L over D is affected. Of course, one of the jobs of you as an aircraft designer, supersonic aircraft designer, would be to improve this performance. That's why some of the aircraft, such as F-22, F-35, will transonically cruise to the theater, then turn on the afterburners and do supersonic flight. So they would not fly supersonically all the way because the poor L over D. So part of the flight will be in the transonic speed regime and they will go to supersonic regime only as needed. What's a Mach cone? We have talked about it. This is a point in the flow. The disturbances generated at that point are confined to within the Mach cone. Sound, as the, as the disturbance flows downwards, it spreads spherically. So spherically it spreads, but it can never outgrow these two red lines. So disturbances are confined to this, uh, this, uh, tri this triangular shape or conical shape. That's why we call it a Mach cone. Mach angle is uh, this angle, mu. So if you think of this distance as a V infinity, if you draw a normal to this uh, blue line, from the blue line to this uh, red line, there'll be the speed of sound, which is A. So A divided by V is a sine of mu. So mu is arc sine of one over Mach number. So M is the local Mach number. Since the disturbances are confined to the Mach cone, if for example, let's say if the body is inside the Mach cone, then its uh, disturbances are not felt elsewhere. So the smaller the disturbances we produce by the placement of a body, the lower the wave drag, the, the lower the sonic boom. For this reason, when you design a wing or even an engine inlet or a fuselage, if you could keep the entire body inside the Mach cone, then you have a less of a chance of a wave, high wave drag. How do you find this? You take the Mach number normal to the leading edge. If this is less than one, it's called a subsonic leading edge. If it's greater than one, it's called a supersonic leading, leading edge. So subsonic leading edge is much better than supersonic leading edge. Of course, uh, there's a practical limit to how far you can sweep the wing backwards because of the increase in the weight to support such a um, shift in the pressure distribution to the aft of the wing and also the interference of the wing with the, main, with the empennage and so forth. But you do your best to do this. Aircraft such as F-14 had a variable sweep wing. So in the transonic flow, they will have a lower sweep. In supersonic flow, they will have a higher sweep. So again, this is the picture of a subsonic leading edge, supersonic leading edge, subsonic trailing edge, supersonic trailing edge. All you have to do is take the Mach number normal to the leading edge and look at it. Some more pictures here. So these are all discussed in the earlier PDF file from Virginia Tech that I had linked, uh, shown earlier by Professor Bill Mason. He came from uh, Grumman. He recently passed away. 
he has done a really wonderful job of discussing such platforms. Now, if a wing is a supersonic leading edge, that means that the lower surface cannot communicate with the upper surface because it would require the sound waves to travel against the supersonic flow, go around the leading edge and influence it. Such a thing is not possible. Likewise, uh, something happening in this region cannot go downstream and then swim against the free stream and uh, influence it because the supersonic flow pushes everything from upstream to downstream within the Mach cone. So supersonic panel methods can limit the influence of a vortex panel on the lower side only to Mach cone immediately behind it. Lower side will not influence the upper side and vice versa if you have a supersonic leading edge. So computationally, things may be a little bit easier. If you have a supersonic, um, a subsonic leading edge, reduce, your wave drag is reduced, but the center of pressure shifts backwards. If the center of pressure is too far back, then the um, no stone pitching moment occurs because the center of gravity is too far forward. Then the tail has to work very hard to keep the uh, things balanced. Alternatively, you can use the fuel transfer from the front part of the aircraft to the back part of the aircraft to keep the center of lift or the center of pressure closer to the center of gravity. So here is a picture of a Concorde aircraft from the Bill Mason's Virginia Tech report. <coughs> Each curve is different uh, growth rate of the aircraft. Let's just follow one of these curves. So this is the up to transonic flow. The center of pressure is near the near the near the near the um, center of lift, uh, center of gravity. So around 52% of the fuselage is where the center of gravity is, and also center of pressure is. But as the Mach number increases, the center of pressure grows back. Therefore the center of gravity should also move backwards. That means you need to have to pump the fuel that's in the upstream part of the fuselage to the backstream part of the fuselage to keep this management. So a lot of uh, computer computerized shift of fuel from one part of the aircraft to the other is needed to make sure that the center of gravity is very close to the center of pressure over the wing. So we mentioned wave drag. So in the early stages of uh, design, when we do the wing body wave drag, they will take the wing and the body together and replace with an equivalent cross-sectional you know, body of revolution. Then they will analyze the wave drag of an equivalent body of revolution. So basically you will take um, different slices of the fuselage find a cross-sectional area, for example, along this slide, this is the cross-sectional area. Along this slice, this is the cross-sectional area. On the other, along this slice, this is the entire cross-sectional area. So depending on the plane, you get the cross-sectional area, then you average it, then you plot the wing body shape. So you may see bumps in the geometry because of the presence of the engines, presence of the fuselage, the presence of the wing, and of course, presence of the empennage. Then you try to use the area ruling, just like uh, Whitcomb had done, to smooth out such bumps. Because it may be shown that the wave drag is caused by the second derivative of the cross-sectional area. This is a closed form expression developed for a bodies of revolution. We will not derive it here because we have lost a lot of time to the campus closing. So this is just given here as a closed form expression. So they would use a relationship such as this. The main point is, if you could minimize the second derivative of the cross-sectional area, you can minimize the wave drag. So this is a typical section. The cross-sectional area is caused by the fuselage and the wing. So this is the cross-sectional area fuselage and the wing. If you could smooth it out, if you could get rid of this bump, then you'll have a better geometry with a lower wave drag. 
So there are all kind of computer programs available for minimizing the drag. They work on the principles shown in the following slides. So basically, you represent this uh, body cross-sectional area as a Fourier series. X is the distance from the nose of the body to the tail of the body. This is the body length L. So when, when epsilon is zero, cosine of epsilon is one, so you reach the tailing edge of the body, the end of the fuselage. When epsilon equal to pi, uh, cosine of pi would be minus one, you reach the leading edge of the body. When epsilon equal to pi over two, you are at the midpoint of the body. So you convert x into epsilon, then you write the cross-sectional area as a Fourier series. So for a given geometry, first you come up with a Fourier fit. After you do that, you can integrate it. This is the volume. The, uh, this is the cross-sectional area. This is the volume. So we could see that the volume inside the body depends only on the first two terms in this Fourier series. Volume is very important because that's where you put the passengers, where you put the payload, where you put the fuel. Therefore, we want to preserve the volume. We want to maximize the volume. We want to maximize the A1, but we want to minimize the wave drag. So how do you do the wave drag? You plug that expression in here, analytically integrate it, then you get this expression. So A1 squared, A2 squared, A3 squared, every term in the Fourier series, which contribute uh, new bumps and wiggles on the cross-sectional area, while they do not contribute to the volume at all, except A1 and A2, they contribute to the wave drag. So by smoothing out and getting rid of the higher order terms, A3, A4, A5, etc., even A2, you can come up with a minimum wave drag. So this is the principle behind the minimization of the wave drag. So there are lots of computer programs that are shown in the references that I told you earlier about. So for a minimum drag body, two parts of our problems are of interest. If the body is closed on both ends, it's called a fuselage. If the body is closed only at the nose, but the blunt base, it's called a bullet. Bullet has got a payload. In this case, it is, could be a, a gunpowder or a whatever is in there. If it's a missile, it may also include electronics. So we want to preserve the volume in both cases, but we want to minimize the wave drag. So let's look at the body closed on both ends. This is the pre, this is the area uh, area cross-sectional distribution. We want to minimize, maximize the volume. So what we could do is we can set A1 to be zero because the cross-section area must be zero at the leading edge when uh, epsilon equal to pi and it should be zero when epsilon equal to zero. So this goes to zero, um, this goes to zero. Epsilon equal to zero is the trailing edge, epsilon equal to pi at the leading edge. So we want A1 to be zero. Otherwise, A1 times pi will be a finite value, which will lead to an open geometry at epsilon equal to zero and also at epsilon equal to pi. So we set A1 to zero. Then A2 must be a negative number. It must be carefully controlled so that the EV match the given volume. So for a given volume, you could explicitly compute A2, then this is the cross-sectional area that we come up with. So A2 is negative of the volume inside the fuselage or inside the bullet. This is the length of the fuselage or the bullet. This is a negative number. Such a geometry is called the Sears hack body. Bill Sears was a Von Karman student from uh, Caltech. Then he became a professor at Arizona, University of Arizona in Tucson. He has made a lot of contributions to unsteady aerodynamics, and also in this case for supersonic wave drag. So if you have a blunt body, a bullet-shaped body, 
then we again want to maximize the volume inside but the area the base area is specified because that determines the caliber of the bullet 22 caliber or 45 caliber whatever it is so yes is specified then you choose a1 based on that you set all the other coefficients a2 a3 a4 etc to zero then such a body is called a von karman ogive body you may remember von karman was a panels colleague in germany he came himself from um, um, from other parts of Europe. He went to Caltech, became a professor after the World War II. His geometry is called a common Wajayev body. So this is the one common Wajayev body shape, bullet shaped body for a given base area. So you, you, this is the cross-sectional variation, or in this case, the radial variation for a body of revolution. This is the sear sac body, which is close to the front and also at the back. So there are lots of useful software available. There's also a minimum drag body. So these type of tools may be used to come up with the design of such geometries. So in summary, we have looked at a very quick way of modeling complete aircraft. We talked about how to compute the skin friction drag. We talked about induced drag. It is nothing more than what panel had done, elliptical loading is the best. Then we talked about uh, trimming the vehicle. We talked about uh, minimizing the wave drag. And we have talked about some of the tools. These are the tools of the trade that are used using the conceptual design of aircraft. Of course, after we have designed the aircraft, then the CFT analysis and wind tunnel studies may follow. So at this point, we have completed our supersonic flow coverage, so we can now move on to the hypersonic flow.